Hey there, sequel lovers. Welcome to the Good, the Bad, and the Sequel Q&A video edition, of course, because you're looking at me right now. And this week, we have a special interview with an actor. He calls himself a character actor, but he's an actor that I've loved in so much over the years, whether it be in the voice of Earl Sinclair on The Dinosaurs, The Dirt Bike Kid, Mannequin 2, The Vagrant, which I saw for the first time recently. He plays that vicious boss and of course i'm talking about stuart penkin stuart has a new movie coming out it's going to be on video on demand it's from saving films it's called deep in the forest it's kind of a different role uh for stuart to have him play in more of a, a drama like more of a serious movie rather than his hilarious roles but man stuart was a blast to talk about he's from philadelphia we talked about how his journey how everything changed just from singing a parody song with Kevin Klein playing piano at a party. Yeah. Lots of great stuff. Do me a favor, subscribe right here. So you don't miss out on any other future interviews or future sequel reviews that we have. Cause we got some great stuff and Stuart's great. So check out his movie deep in the forest from saving films. It's video on demand, May 31st. I'll put the trailer in the notes and where you can find it, but you'll see it everywhere. It has Stuart in it. And also has Peter Jason, who's our guest next week. So without further ado, here is Stuart Penkin. Subscribe. How you doing? Hey, I'm fine. This is great, man. Good. Huge fan. Huge fan of yours. You've been in so much that I grew up watching. And then w when you're a kid, you don't know voice actors. Like I've interviewed a lot of people that have so many voice credits, but sometimes you don't know it unless you see their face yeah, and it yeah. wasn't until like god i think when i watched it on netflix uh dinosaurs and i'm like holy shit putting two to two together like you and Je jessica walter as the as uh earl and it's unbelievable yeah the great jessica walter god bless yeah you. so how did uh I, you're a local guy i'm in jersey you grew up outside of philadelphia or in philadelphia Oh, I grew up well outside of Center City. Oh, okay. Uh, Wynwood. I went to school in Ardmore. Lived in the Oak 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 Lane. My parents moved. They I had a I had a hag, private detective to find them. They tried to they tried to lose me, but they couldn't. <laughs> they I couldn't. lived in a bunch of places in Philadelphia. Grew up in Winfield. You know, born on Thirtieth Street, like way like down out we're like broad street and you know out there yeah doesn't matter it's enough about me let's talk about you Doug. what do you want to know about me <laughs> nothing particularly exactly <laughs> no it's so uh so that movie that you have coming out on may 31st deep uh, in the forest it's yeah. so funny if you look on youtube on the trailer people are comment and it says like this could never happen and it's like what that movie is about it happens in Russia and China and North Korea, the exact plot of that movie. Yeah, yeah. There was a, a, a quote, I can't remember now, but my character Max, because the movie is about Max, my character is a, uh, is a constitutional scholar, and he talks about how fascism and, and, and even Nazism starts. It doesn't start with... This or that. I should look it up. I I I don't know where. I it'll take me forever to get it. But it okay. doesn't start with uh, with with um, with a big you know armies marching. It starts little ways. You know suppression of the of the of the press and and religious freedom and 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 economic sanctions. Uh, and it happens all the time. I mean, it happens. You know, it's happening a little bit now. So I know. There you go. No, interesting. So I always love to fi find out how people like started. So growing up in Philadelphia, like what was your You sound like inspiration? From, you're from Philadelphia. You're from Jersey though. I am from Jersey. I know. Me and my wife, we grew up in central Jersey, but anywhere we ever go, Philadelphia. no accent. Really? I just, we don't have a Jersey accent. No, I don't know what that is, but I, I sense a little Philadelphia, maybe a little Baltimore, but maybe that's huh? just you know, maybe your tongue is is, is deformed. I don't know. Maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did you uh, like? What was it about acting? Was it watching on TV or going to a play? What was the inspiration? 
Well, you know, as a kid, I always used to have fun jumping around, making my family laugh. We had Friday night dinners with, you know, with a bunch of aunts and uncles that I loved. I used to be sorry for people who weren't members of our family. I mean, I love my family that much. So I used to do that. And then that was, and I, I, I didn't do any theater in, I, well, like I was a campaign manager for a guy in, in, in high school. You know, I had that theatrical thing in, inside of me bubbling somewhere. Didn't do any, any theater in uh, high school because the auditorium collapsed. The entire ceiling just fell down. So there was no drama. I think I did a play, uh, which sort of should have tipped me off. But I, uh, I, I went to college and I was going to major in, uh, I signed up to be a psychology major because I enjoyed that so much. And, uh, oh, wow. Which is not that far from, from, from acting, I guess, if you think about it. I mean, it, there is a connection there. But I, uh, uh, um, the, the information, the uh, audition was sent out to do this first play at Dickinson College. And I walked across, I say, as I say, that long, lonely, dark campus and to audition for this play. And I knew, you know, I knew that, uh, and I met Dave Brubaker, who was my teacher, my director, and later. Oh, wow. So he was an inspiration. And as soon as I, as soon as I, I knew it, you know, I knew it. And my friend Bernie said, uh, there was no drama major. There were like five classes that you could take. There is now. And, and Bernie said, you know, the proper major for, uh, for an actor is English. So I became an English major. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, what was that, that's it. And then uh, from there, you just said, you know what, this is where it's for me. And then you went to Columbia, right? To go for your I went master's. to Columbia, to the graduate program at Columbia for three years. Met my wife, which was a nice thing. Oh, that's good. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, studied there. I mean, people people always say, do you, do you really think I need to go to school? You know, should you have just gotten into the job market? Well, you know, maybe it's it's selfish, but yeah, you need to, you need to study, you know, words and movements and, and, and sword fighting. You need to study that stuff. You gotta, yeah. you know, as my brilliant uh, voice teacher, Robert Neff Williams said, you know, you guys came into here as, uh, as cocky college actors and, you know, hopefully we'll send you out with some skills so that you can, you know, make a living. So that's <laughs> what I did. And then you went right to Broadway. Was that the first oh, no, step no. right after that? Oh, no, no, no. no? <laughs> well, I, I gotta think. I went to, from Columbia, I went to the New York Shakespeare Festival oh, nice. in the park, Shakespeare in the Park. Uh, I did that for t two summers. I, I ca literally carried a spear, you know. I mean, that's what I did, and understudied some 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 big parts and got to go on in rehearsals for that. But that was uh, that was an eye opening thing. That was a terrific two summers. Met a lot of wonderful people. In fact, uh, it's a strange story, but we were doing Richard III and I wrote some music for Richard III, just some parody songs for Richard III, uh, which later I turned into a Cinemax comedy special called Hump, which uh, <laughs> is available out there if you want it. Oh, but Kevin, awesome. Klein like was, it. Kevin Klein was a, uh, was a spirit carrier too, and he plays the piano. So he used to accompany me when we had com uh, commercial, we had rehearsal breaks, and I used to sing these songs. And we were at a party uh, once and... Kevin said, somebody said, sing that song. And I said, I guess I had a drink, which I never do. I said, okay. So Kevin played the piano and I sang some of my Richard III parodies. And because of that, I got an agent, uh, my first agent in New York. So, I mean, it's strange how things happen. Wow. But I went from, I think I went from Columbia to that. I, I, I spent a year as a journeyman at Lincoln Center, uh, which they call Broadway, but it's not really Broadway. You know, and did a few things. Did the American Place Theater out there, did a bunch of off-Broadway plays. A uh, couple, of, one off, 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 off. <laughs> you know, it was like in, it was like was in somebody's living room, <laughs> and uh, and then you know the the, the Milliken. Ah, sorry about the beeps. It's okay. And I did, then I did the Mil Milliken show, and uh, which is a great industrial show. That's a whole other episode. We have to that 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 I could think, I could talk hours about that. But then the call came out for the San Pedro Beach Buns, which is Aaron Spelling's first and last attempt at hour-long comedy. And I auditioned for that and uh, got it. And that's how I got to California. So, so that, I, was the, that was the reason you went out there? You were still in New York? They flew oh, you out yeah. to audition or did you audition in the city? Yeah. Auditioned here. Yeah. And then they flew us out for the final auditions, whatever, uh, in in, uh, in California at ABC in near Los Feliz. And... Uh, I got it, and uh, 
we kept our apartment in New York for, for I think, at least two years because we didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah, right. When the San Pedro Beach Bunch closed, is anybody really interested in me? I mean, anyway, <laughs> I, uh, I when, when that ended after 10 shows, we were very, all of us, because we were kids, we were very disappointed and a little uh, not knowing what to do. But I signed a, a development deal with Universal, which meant they gave you a paltry amount of money, but you couldn't do anything f- for anybody else except Universal for a year. Ah. You know, and I eventually did a pilot, which I was very happy they didn't sell because it was a terrible experience. And then, uh, and that, and when that was over, I started slowly but surely to get to get some work, some guest parts, and, and commercials and stuff. And then it, it just, you know, breaks happen, and you get to be, uh, you get to be, um, you know fairly successful because you're you're lucky and you kind of back it up with something i mean but you got to be lucky and uh, and i was lucky i was absolutely lucky in many ways to be able to sit here and talk to you yeah no it's one of the 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 failure rate in the business is like (laughs) and the failure rate it's like almost like so crazy that people do succeed is most people 95 percent yeah 95 percent failure rate in, in sad and of that 5% of the works, maybe 2 to 3% make a living. That's crazy. It, it, it is crazy. I mean, when people people say to me, well, why don't you teach? You're kind of retired. I don't know if I'm going to retire. If anybody wants me, just give me a call. Give them a call. They'll, they'll, yeah. You know, and I say, I can't sit across the room from a bunch of, of shining faces and tell them to, to go into show business. It's just real hard. But I'll tell you from my own experience, if you want to do it, you can't be stopped. You, yeah, you, you have to, there, there's some compelling need in you to, you know, to, to do theater, to do, to be in show business. I mean, in, in the East and in college, I just did every play I could. And then my wife was actually in, in a school near Pittsburgh, helped start a, a, a summer theater. Uh, and because of her, I mean, I, and then it eventually became a, a really good equity theater because of her, I, I, I got to do, we worked there for years and years and years doing plays and parts that I would really never get cast in, in, in the real world, but, yeah. you know, but, but it, it was an experience that I, I wouldn't have traded. I mean, it was, it was invaluable just for, for fun, for meeting friends and for learning what the hell to do when you, when you get a script in front of you. Yeah. So obviously you always wanted to do this and you had the drive and obviously like you said, you wouldn't be sitting here today. What was, was there like getting on like Barney Miller? Cause a lot of people I've talked to, they say like when you get on one of those shows, when they, people, when other casting directors or other directors see you on, you know, a, a, a show, a primetime <laughs> show, then from there you go from all the other shows. I've seen that with people like they're on a Fox show and like you look at the rest of their like couple of years, they're on every Fox series that's on. Okay, there. Yeah. Well, I- I'm not sure that happened to me, um, but that's true. If you do in, in the days in the seventies and the eighties, when I was, uh, was, was trying to, you know, to, to really establish myself, uh, you did, let's say you, you played a, a thief. I'm making it up, you yeah. know, so you get offered thieves, you know, or you do, I was the fat, funny guy. So I, you know, I got the comedy roles, which is fine. You know, uh, in those days, the money, you had a picture, you had a price. I mean, it was, there was not a lot of negotiation. Now there's no negotiation, but in those days, you know, the, you, you try to get as much money, but the money wasn't as important as just getting the work and getting a, a reputation. When I did Dinosaurs, that was, the, that was indeed getting me involved with the Disney voiceover people because of dinosaurs. Then I did do a bunch of Disney shows, uh, voiceover cartoons after that because of dinosaurs. But I don't, I, I can't honestly say because I did a guest spot on a Warner Brothers show. Or yeah, yeah. That I, that I was now, oh, put in another one. I, I, I don't think that's the way it worked with me. It might be the way it worked with, uh, with other people. Yeah. But it was just, it's like piecemeal. I mean, you, you job out. You're, you're a, you know, you, you, as an actor, you job out. So you I'm like, do- lucky to get a series. Yeah, no, like you were saying you got like the fat, funny friend. I would say my favorite type of character that you would play would—I don't even know how you how you describe it—but like in the Dirt Bike Kid, Mannequin Two, and like the Vagrant. Like I watched the Vagrant for the first officious, time. Officious, officious yeah. bosses. Officious. Yeah. I I used to play a bunch of those. The same, you know, it was the same character. I mean, yeah. it was it was like 
That's exactly right. I was thinking about that today. I said, I play an awful lot of officious uh. bosses or managers or, you know, teachers, you know, yep. but it's the, it's the same kind of rhythm. I mean, I guess people cast and see me in that and they say, okay, you can do that. That's the way you're you so help. good at it. Like no, when you, you. when you. you see the, when you see like the dirt bike kids, great. I remember watching that a lot as a kid. But seeing the vagrant for the first time, there's a scene, and again, you've been in so much, not like you'd remember, but like you're like telling Bill Paxton that he's going to be up for, hey, would you want to be the new uh, analyst? And he's like looking so happy, you're like, <laughs> and you start laughing like, with your female uh, like coworker, and then you do this walk away, you stop and you pull a teddy bear off of some girl's desk on her monitor, throw it in the garbage, and do this like the evil laugh, and I'm like, I can see him just do that. Like that's yeah, not even in the yeah. script, just grabbing that and dropping that right in the trash. I, I don't know if it was in the script or not, but I'm happy to remember it. Yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, it's an actor. If you're a character actor, like when I did plays in New York and in the and in St. Vincent summer theaters, then St. Vincent theater, you got to play all kinds of parts. I mean, you know, English people, were officious people, shy people, you know, a lot of the, mo a great deal of the stuff I did in the East, in uh, in in summer theater, and in, um, I, I guess even uh, some of these off Broadway, you know, off, off off Broadway thing, you got to play different characters. You got to do different things. They kind of, I don't know, I'll make up a phrase, typecast you in uh, in, uh, in in California uh, because it's just too much. First of all, there's too many. There's a lot of good actors. There's too many good actors out there. And they want if they need an officious boss or manager, you know. Hopefully, you're at the, you're on that list, you know. So that you know, and you're and you're happy to be there. Uh, the old the old joke for me is that when you're in New York, you say, "How do I get to California? How do I get to California?" And then you get to California, and you you know you play these parts on television, which are not horribly challenging. You say, "How do I get to New York? How do I get back to New York?" <laughs> but, but that's the truth. But you're yeah. right about Mister My Officious uh, Manager character. Yeah, and I think it's too with the audience. You don't want to you don't want to trick an audience. If you have a like your character, say people know you in certain roles, they don't want to be like, "Whoa, he's evil." That guy's supposed to be this other guy, or vice versa. You know, they do well, that yeah, so but... many times with actors. As soon as you play a TV mom, they're never going to cast you as that evil or anything like that. I played a TV mom three times, and they never cast me again. Didn't. But it's interesting that I think. Uh, uh, Paul Newman, I think he tried to play a bad guy, and in, in, in a movie, and it was it never worked because the audience wouldn't accept him as that. And he tried, you know, he wanted to be. I mean, he's a theater guy, and he wanted to be. And you know, I always, I always tell people my ideal role would be to be a psychopathic uh, killer who eats babies. That's what I like to play. You know, just something, just you know, different. In plays, I get to do that. In in in. In Hollywood, no, not so much. I asked Eric Roberts that because he goes and does plays every so often and he does a ton of like indie films. And he said, yeah. I want to play a transvestite one day. Well, there you <laughs> go. Right. Yeah. There you go. You know, you know I played, I put, I put on a lot of dresses and a lot of plays. <laughs> you you know, still, obviously, right now, but throughout the years when you're acting on TV and film, were you still getting to do theater? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, from from we came out here in 77 from 72 i started to work at the summer the in the theater in saint in pittsburgh near pittsburgh and we did that off and on until the mid 80s so yeah i mean we went back as often as we could look we had dear friends there i was yeah. married at, at that uh, in that uh, college uh, our our producer was our priest you know who married who married us. my the director <laughs> producer was my best friend for 37 years so yeah we try as often as we could we went back there to and i, and I love playing with my wife too so oh that's gonna be great yeah especially it's, being married to somebody that gets the business you know because it is like such a unique job it really is you know yeah there's it's so show business look look it isn't it isn't laying bricks. It isn't, you know, pouring tar on a road. Uh, my friend, who I mentioned, in Saint Vincent, they said, "Well, you work." And I said, "I haven't worked in years. I do. I'm a theater director. Yeah. I used to work when I used to lay road. You know, this. Is, but it's a complicated. It's a complicated business, especially now. 
when, like I said, there's so many actors out there. Yeah. I mean, so many. Now, there's a lot of product. You look at Netflix and Prime Video and, and all that stuff. There are, I'm going to just make it up and say thousands in these various uh, pay cable and network. Uh, you know, the, the product, they just pour it out. And some of it is real crap. Oh, you know, yeah. But it's out there. But it's out there and actors can get can get work. Uh, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever worked in a Netflix movie. It's out there, but they've passed me by, bastards. How dare they? So it's just, what would you say in that was the movie or the TV show that you knew like, hey, I can make a living off this? Obviously in your mind, you're going to do this forever. Was there one show or movie that you're like, all right, this is, I can do this? Well, I guess... If I if you if you nailed me if you laid me if I had to say something it would be not necessarily the news on HBO yeah uh, right. which I, I think that's kind of got me into the into the public and, and the and the producer eye I also at the same at the same time overlapping did fatal attraction yeah uh, in fact I flew back and forth for a month once a day twice once or to do one or two days in New York flew back to do the other show flew back. I mean, for a month, I was I was Mr. Red Eye, uh, doing two shows, and I'm unbelievably grateful for that. I mean, that's that was great. But I think not necessarily news. Back in the early '80s, was a thing that uh, maybe made people aware of me more than you know. That's before. early HBO, right? HBO is four years old, three years old at that point. Yeah, if there that... was. You should pardon the expression. Twenty nine percent penetration of, of, of cable. Cable. Excuse me, not pay cable. Pay cable was even less. So it's astounding how how uh, successful that show became with so relatively few people watching. Yeah. Uh, and then as the years went on, the six years that I did it, uh, it 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 grew and it became the National Cable Television Association was was a pretty wonderful uh, organization to be involved with. They ran the Ace Awards and and a lot of events. When we were not necessarily the news, they sent us around the country teaching classes to kids, you know, improv classes. It was a great, it was a, it was a terrific time uh, to be involved with HBO. Then, you know, then HBO and cable went like this and the networks went like that. So then, you know, cable sort of became something, something else. There ain't no cable awards anymore. It's all, it's all, you know, the television academy. Yeah. Do you always do improv? Was that something you always did? No, I never did improv. Not professionally. No. A lot of the guys that I worked with, not necessarily the news, were, were did improv at Second City, and uh, uh, but no, I never professionally did improvisation. I enjoy it, you know, yeah. when, we're, when we're screwing around. But uh, no, there are uh, that's there are guys that are so brilliant at that, and and that it's like stand up. I, I never did stand up. Don't want to do stand up, but there's. You know, it's too hard. That's work. I mean, that's kind of work. <laughs> did the, a lot of your things you worked on, did you ever riff, like working with directors that they're like, hey, Stuart, you want to try something here? Yes. The answer is yes. And I also, I also, from the, from the first show I did out here, the San Pedro Bunch, I had the chutzpah, as we say in Italian, to, uh, to, uh, to rewrite. If I didn't like something, if I read a script, and that was that was a wet behind the ears. I just the first thing I ever did. But if I saw something that was that was I didn't like, I rewrote it. And the other guys started to do that a little bit. And the one director said to the producer, "These kids are uh, they're rewriting the script. You know, there's a and, and you know we try to give the take. We try to do the script as it was written, and then we just riffed on it. And the producer said, "Look." For the one percent that they screw up and we have to cut around it or change it, is worth the ninety nine percent that they usually improve it. So he says, "You just film what they want you to film." And that that was validating, you know. And I've been doing that. I, I do that a lot, you know. I'm a you know I'm a, a what's the word a, a rebel. Uh, uh, if I but if I see something that's, that doesn't work, I, I I like to you know chip chip in. I yeah, mean, I lost a. I lost a job once to a famous director who I won't name, and he said to me, "Will you? Uh, if I cast you in this, will you? Uh, will you give yourself to me? Will you open yourself up to me? Would you put yourself in my hands?" And I, and I said, foolishly, I said, "Well, I hope if you cast me, it would be a collaborative effort, and we would we would work together and come up with the best idea." 
Didn't get that job. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> but later, the producer of that show, a uh, wonderful writer uh, named Pat Proft, who did all the, you know, the, the Charlie Sheen movies and then the Police Academy stuff. He did a lot oh, of that. Yeah. yeah, he's great, and we became friends. And he said later, much later, he says we wanted you to do it, but the director, who was again pretty powerful one of this other guy. So that was okay, because uh, I, I I got other jobs through Pat. So it worked out fine. Yeah. And then, like, you hit so many series. So that San Pedro series, you were, had, like, little spots throughout in between San Pedro and then all the other shows. But, man, then you were Nearly Departed, Falcon yeah. Crest. Yeah. Well, Nearly Departed was a – was uh, yeah, a limit, that didn't last long. Falcon Crest, I was a recurring character on that. Yeah. That was great. That was great. That's big. Whenever you get that role, whenever you get the recurring character, that's like a big deal. Big deal. Very big deal. And and extremely rewarding. And and you can pay the mortgage that month. I mean, it was, you know, it it worked out. Not that the money was that great back then, but you know, it, it was it was wonderful to be able to know that sometime within a week or two, you're going to get the call. Yeah, come back and do something. Yeah, I did about. I guess I did about five recurring, nice recurring roles, uh, and uh, maybe about four pilots, which is very lucky. I mean, I, I consider yeah. myself very lucky to do that. Guys, there's a lot of guys that don't do half as much, and there are guys that do three times as much. But yeah. I'm lucky. I feel very grateful to have done what I what I did. Yeah, knots landing too, all around that time within like four or five years recurring yeah. roles. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, right after my son was born. It was a mid to the late 80s, that, that that stuff started to happen. He was your good luck charm. Look at that. Yeah, I know. Oh, my God. And then sandwich in between, arachnophobia. Arachnophobia. Oh. Great experience. Yeah? Great experience. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, you know, the, the fact, anything you ask me about, for the, for the most part, and I, I, I ain't going to lie, most of it has been very positive. That's great. You know, I mean, we – not necessarily the news was interviewed by TV Guide a long time ago. And then they called each of us after the interview. He says, yeah, everybody seems to like each other. Isn't there any bit of dirt? Isn't there any bit of controversy, any conflict, contratant? And we all said, no, we like each other. And the fact is, we still do like each other. Yeah. You know, but ar arachnophobia, it was nice because the first time I met Frank Marshall, who I worked with again, uh, I just sat in his office and talked to him. And I didn't audition. I didn't read a damn thing. And he, and I got to call the you know a couple of days later. So she got the job. So I did. And uh, and it was a, it was a fun experience. We shot in Camry, which is a shouldn't mention it because it's too beautiful for people to know about. It's uh, it's uh, up on the on the shore, north shore of uh, uh, south, the west shore of of, uh, of California. Oh, I also okay. met Peter. Did you uh, did you talk to Peter Jason about this movie? No, tomorrow. So I was going to say oh. is looking at your. Two IMDb's is, is did you guys form a friendship then? Because it seems like oh you worked with each other over the years and all these little parts. Yeah, we Peter and I became friends real quick. Oh, nice. Yeah, quick. He was my friend, my son's special friend at his school. He, oh. he, built, he built a playhouse at the Peter one day at dinner. I'm going to buy a playhouse. Peter's a great carpenter. He's a terrific carpenter. Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and he paints it and stuff. But he's a great carpenter. And he, uh, I said, Peter, I'm going to buy a playhouse. You go to Costco or something. Like that. What are you talking about? Uh, buy a playhouse. We're going to build it. Next day, he showed up with his car. We got, he uses all used wood, all used. I bought hinges at a, at a hardware store once. He screamed at me. He said, take them back. He would, you know, but we built, or maybe he did. I was his sous chef, a playhouse for my son. We, Peter and I, Peter and I, you know, I, I love the guy. We worked in a bunch of stuff together. Yeah. Some of, uh, a lot of it with Jeremy Lanny, who did uh, Deep in the Forest, his short films. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we did a movie called Hopelessly in June where we were married. We played a gay couple. I was the wife. <laughs> no, P Peter, you know, he's, he's my dear friend. I love him. Yeah. He's another guy like his career. He started, one of his first movies was a, a John Wayne movie. One of the last John Wayne movies. Oh, he worked when he was a child. He was, I think, in diapers when he did that movie. He played John Wayne, the legitimate son. No. <laughs> I, I, I tell people, if you go on your phone and look at Peter Jason's IMDb page, you're going to run out of battery power before you get <laughs> He's just worked for years and years and years. Why? Because yeah. he's great to have on a set. 
he's good, you know, he's pleasant, he's the most positive human being in the world. And uh, and people love to have him around. So you know, and he always he always makes makes a positive statement on the set. So Peter's Peter. I'm not worried about Peter. No, good, good. I'm no, not worried either. <laughs> I don't want to talk about him. He's 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 too nice. Yeah, no, that's great. And then on that movie, the weirdest thing I've ever seen on somebody's IMDb when you click on biography on yours, it says "scared of bugs." No, I you it's know the I weirdest don't know. thing. I don't know how that stuff goes on there. Maybe no, they saw arachnophobia and they thought that was like a documentary and that was really you. No, I'll tell you that's that's quite frankly a lie. I don't know where that comes from. IMDb is not perfect, and that's yeah. one of the, one of the reasons, one of the ways that it is not perfect. I'm not scared of bugs. Ah! Oh, sorry. <laughs> was that movie? Was that a little like? Because there were actual they use actual spiders like when oh, you were yeah. in those scenes. Yeah, we had to. As a matter of fact, they were New Zealand spiders. And I think they cost 1100 bucks a pop to bring them over. And we had to, we spent a, not a day, but a morning going to the set with the spiders and having them crawl on us, you know, so that we would get used to it in case something happened. Because, you know, they, they didn't want to, you know, some, some actor seeing a spider and go, ah, you know, $1,100 down the drain. Yeah. So we had to deal with those spiders just to be comfortable, be comfortable. And they were real spiders. They were all real spiders. Well, except for the, for the bad guy at the end, he was not. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, it's, it's so crazy. When, when you have a movie like that with these tiny spiders and the scene when you guys are checking the house for the spider, just how scared you are watching it, like ch- checking behind everything, opening up the cabinets. Wow. You started, I think, going in the fridge and like, looking for things. I, think. I went, probably went in the fridge. I know I had a moment with a bug. I found a bug in a box of cereal. <laughs> I got real scared. Yep. That was a real dead spider. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was great. And there were some terrific actors in it. Peter was, oh, in yeah. it. Jeff Daniels, Harley J. Kovac, uh, Jimmy. I forget. I'm, I'm old. You'll look it up. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. So, it was great. Uh, we're yeah, in no. Great, I'm great. great for Kathy Kinney. We're in that. I actually wrote a song for arachnophobia, which was used in the trailer. Really? Yeah, it was they they bought it from to to use it in the in the trailer. How does that come about? Do you just write on your own, or did you say? You know, I, I, I do since I was even younger. Than now, I, I like to do song parodies, not parodies of the songs, but using. Well, this arachnophobia song I, I made kind of made up the tune, but I love doing songs if I'm inspired in a project that's that's really good. So I was just sitting around once, and it just came to me, you know. <sighs> It's a sweet little town. Take a bus. Come on down. Canima waits for you at the end of the trip. You'll find blood on your lip. Canima waits for you. You know, and it goes on about spiders and, and uh, you know, and being bitten, being killed. And they bought it. It was fun to do. I do it for fun. You know, I, I, I never write them to think about selling. Wow. Although they filmed that one. They actually filmed that one you know, during the lunch hour. And it was nice because that got us, uh, that got us a couple of bucks for, uh, for the trailer. That's awesome. What was yeah, it? What, you started doing that as a young kid? You were doing that? No, no. Well, yeah. Yeah, I did. Uh, you know, silly songs like one of my earliest, and you might, I hope I get residuals for it. Wash your hands, dry them well, when, or they will hurt and they will swell. When you go outdoors to play, they will sting the live long day. <laughs> that's that's one of my original <laughs> songs when I was Really? Eight. Yeah. You I've heard that. Wait, really how have I heard that? I've heard that before. Did no, you, do? you haven't. It sounds like it's some kind of tune. Maybe, well, maybe whatever song like... you, whatever uh, beat you used or whatever backup track to that, that sounded like something. My my backup track was my headboard in my bed when I was in the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I enjoy doing that. I do that a lot. Yeah. Uh, writing a song, fu- funny lyrics to songs. And we, we've done any number of uh charity events for schools uh you, you know an actor named paul Kreppel? if you know you look him up. he's a terrific actor we worked and we've been friends for years we work together and we do these song parodies for these for these charity events and uh it's some of the it's it's some of the proudest work i've done to be honest with you nobody's ever seen it you know unless i post it and i haven't posted it yet yeah but it's some of the most satisfying fun stuff that uh, that i've ever done in, in show business Really? So Paul Kreppel. 
Yeah, Paul Kraft. I'll have to check him he's, out. He's a nice guy to talk to. You should talk to him. Yeah. He was on, uh, he played a, oh man, I, I did the show and I can't remember it. He was a piano player, Sonny, Sonny's Fox, Sonny something. A piano player with a bunch of waitresses. Look him up, Paul Kraft. I will, I will. So how does, nice so, di- so dinosaurs, I know that was like, what is your, like your second or third voice acting role? Cause you did like a DuckTales or something like a few years before that. Yeah, well, because like I said, no, probably the cartoons, like I said, came from dinosaurs, came okay. from with the Disney people. Uh, the call came out, Michael Jacobs, who was the producer who who I had done a, 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 brief, a limited series with, uh, remembered me from the audition for the San Pedro Beach Bums. Oh he did God. Girl Meets World, Girl, Boy Meets World. He did those yeah, shows. Yeah. He's a, he's a very successful. So he called me in to, to audition for it. Every actor in Hollywood came into that because the voice service is a great job. Yeah. And I got it. Uh, and uh, again, lucky, glad to do it, man. I mean, just, it was a terrific, it was, it was, I call it a great job to have and a really tough show to do because we had to replace the voices with the Henson puppeteers. So it wasn't, in, in cartoons, you're kind of creative. You create the character and then they animate to you. In dinosaurs, they they did the voices first, yeah. and you had to match the mouths. And my guy was a little English guy, Matt Wilson, and she said, "Hi, honey, I'm home." You know, and talk like this. So obviously, they didn't want that. So they hired me. Hi, honey, I'm home. So that's 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 what happened with dinosaurs, and uh, it was a great three years. I mean, it was uh, it's a one and that show because it's been re released on Disney Plus. Uh, people are now rediscovering it. And uh, and I get a lot of mail about it and, and comments about dinosaurs. And it should be. It's a very good show. It was. I talked with Bruce Lenoyle, who played right. Charlene, and he told me it got to uh, – it was – I don't know if it was always it from the beginning, but it was the most expensive uh, show on television to do. Yes. It was the most expensive half-hour television show to do. Well, Bruce was, Bruce was one of the puppeteers. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sally, uh, Sally, Sally Struthers was the voice. Sally Struthers was the voice. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was the most expensive television show to do because of the salaries of the Hanson people and building the sets and the animatronics. I mean, those cost those big animatronic puppets had to be kept up to speed and kept up kept looking good. It, it was just the most expensive. I mean, that's one of the reasons I guess that it wasn't renew, renewed. But it came to a good end. I mean, the la- it came to a oh to yeah. A good At least you guys got to do that. Some shows don't get that. They make that exactly. decision, you know, in the in the summer or whenever you know the show's off, and then you watch this show that's like either they clunk together some kind of ending on their own edit, or you right. just it just left to sit there. It's, right, and people are often frustrated about it. But the dinosaurs uh, crew and, and writing staff, they I guess they knew. And they wrote this wonderful, if not controversial, ending about the dinosaurs dying. It was terrific. I thought it was terrific. Yeah, I think the show, when you go back and watch it, I don't know if anybody's mentioned like specific episodes, but I remember when I did that rewatch probably like 10 years ago when it was on Netflix. And I that's when I was like, wow, Stuart Penkins, the voice. But on yeah. there, there were some really super like like very adult themed episodes. Like the actual basis of the story, you're like, wow, this isn't like a kitsch like the actual thing of it, you know? Well, that's, that's why the show was kind of successful because the puppets attracted the kids. The kids love looking at the puppets and look and, you know, not the, not the mama and all that stuff. They love that. I'm not the baby. And the adults could appreciate the, the, the satire about yeah. sexual harassment and, and global yes. warming. It, it was, it was a very clever show. They were very, you know, they were intelligent guys who were writing that show, and, they, and it came through. All those showrunners and writers uh, now, I guess they were writers then, are now showrunners and very successful showrunners. They run their own shows. They write their own shows. <laughs> you know, these guys are talented guys. Yeah, Bruce is telling me that they would do, like, I guess all the ABC shows would play in a softball league, and he would play oh, yeah. against – he would play against Coach. And he said usually – it was all of the behind the scenes people, camera, puppeteers and stuff. Right, and he right. said, I can't think of his name and it's terrible because my daughter loves SpongeBob and he's the voice of Patrick. But anyway, the big tall guy on coach 
he showed up. He would be the only actor to show up just to use his like right. baseball I, I or football skills. Yeah, yeah. All right. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Good actor. Wasn't yeah. he in uh, in uh, in um, Poltergeist? Wasn't he the one of the stars in Poltergeist? No, that's Craig T. Nelson. Good night. <laughs> Good night. See, I'm picturing Craig T. Nelson when you're talking about this tall guy. So obviously, I know nothing. He's just as big as him. Yeah, he's just as big. <laughs> so, so then, so then, like Disney. So getting Disney that was a big thing because from there you were in so many different Disney shows, and you were in yeah. Honey I Shrunk Ourselves. Honey I Shrunk Ourselves. Yeah, I guess I did do. Going back to your original thing, I guess that did lead to uh, to other dis- to other shows on that net on the same network, voiceovers and a couple other. That's so Raven, and I did a uh, three. Disney movies called Xenon Girl of the 21st Century. And there were three movies that, uh, how old your daughter? She is three and a half. Oh, well, when she gets to be seven, show her the Xenon movies. She'll enjoy those. I will. I but will. yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, uh, because of Dinosaurs and and the other, and some of the other stuff I did, I, I guess I did do a, a bunch of Disney stuff. You know, you're right. <laughs> That's so right, when you so right. We- yeah, I don't hear that. My wife never says that. She never tells me I'm right. So it's good to hear Stuart Pankin say that. So my when you're, a, yeah, my wife gave me a cup and said, "You don't need Google. You have me. I'm always right." Oh, nice. <laughs> so when you're doing a movie like Honey, I, I I shrunk ourselves. Do you have any idea, like, when you sign on to a movie, do you know what the budget is or anything like that? No, no, um, no. Uh, I knew that we were all getting favored nations, which means that all the actors, except for Rick, Rick, who deserved it, got a lot more than we did. But we all got the other four or five actors in it got uh, got the same amount of money. And it wasn't, you know, it was not, it was a nice amount of money, but it wasn't what Rick was getting. So I don't know what the budget. I do know that that movie was the first made for video movie uh, ever made. They, yeah. you know, they, they, they they filmed it. It was never going to be a feature. It was never going to be. It was going to be a made-for-video movie. They were going to put it out on VHS or DVD, whatever was available then, and, and and sell it and play it. Yeah, I was reading that the guy who directed it. It was his first movie, and I think he was the cinematographer on the first two, maybe. No, he was Dean Cundey directed. He was the he was Steven Spielberg's primary cinematographer. Oh, okay, that's what it was. Yeah. You know, and he so he's been around the block, and he and he did, he directed. I don't know if it was his first movie, was one of his first movies. If not yeah, first movie. yeah, he was uh, he was great. He ran a great ship. No, I was reading about the budget because it said initially when he got brought on. Again, these are things you read online. It was supposed to be like a monstrous bu- budget of like forty million, but then no, get out of here. I don't know. Okay. Then I guess if that's what it was. I'm asking for more money. Yeah, no, but then it got cut down because of exactly what you said. Because I think that's when Disney started hitting big with Pixar in the theaters. So that's why they made uh, that movie because of its gravitas. Because what the first movie is still to this day. Because yeah, yeah, now yeah. they're doing Shrunk with uh, Rick coming back. Yeah. I didn't they, know that. They should have called you. Oh, you are the bad. brother anyway. What's the matter with them? I thought Rick had my back. Yeah, Josh Gad. If you know who he is, if yeah, you look him who, up, I know who he is. <laughs> when you think of him, you can think that that is the little kid all grown up, maybe. So that's gonna be Rick Moranis' son, it's gonna be uh, little Zelinsky. Oh, uh, well, maybe they'll push me in. I can they can wheel me in in a wheelchair as an old guy, just you know, oh, yeah. You, I <laughs> you can call Rick, just put my photo on the wall. That's all I want. <laughs> photo in the background. That's all. You don't even have to yeah. mention me. There was something in the back of my head that that I heard or read it, that they were doing another version of. Shrunk. I mean, Rick, God bless him, he gave up the business. His wife died yeah. tragically, too, and he gave up the business to take care of his children. Nothing more admirable. Uh, and I'm glad he's getting back. To be honest with you, I'm glad he's uh, he's a very funny, talented guy, and I, and I and he should get back and he should start to do some stuff. Yeah, one of the really think about his early career, like God, some of the best movies ever. The roles that he played, like what he can do. So great. We actually read for uh, for Ghostbusters, and he got the part. God bless him, which is fine. 
And uh, I, I worked with Rick again, I think first maybe on big on a movie called Big Bully. With, oh, yeah. Uh, with uh, who Tom Harrison? Arnold? Tom Arnold. Yeah. yeah. So we did that. We had a couple of nice days doing that together. And then we did uh, Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves. It was nice. It was great working with him. He's a, so you auditioned for the same role as Rick in Ghostbusters? In Ghostbusters, yeah. That role? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, uh, like I said, I was, I didn't have the chops yet. You know, probably it was, it was a long, long time ago. And Rick had been working in, you know, Canada for years and years and years. I had not. So God bless him. You know, God bless him. He was great. <laughs> So I always love asking people throughout like your career, did you ever like have the wherewithal to like grab mementos or s- take anything from like any sets of movies you're on or anything? Yeah, I'm sure I did. I'm sure yeah. either they gave it to you or, you know, lots of times you do movie, you do TV shows or movies and like deep in the forest, uh, the costume people gave us our costume, whatever they bought for us. Oh, cool. Them. Yeah, I, I grabbed, I have it there. I did a movie called Silence of the Hands. Yeah, I interviewed, uh, I talked to uh, Pro, uh, Lance Kinsey. Lance Kinsey. Lance is that, yeah, uh, we never had scenes together, but I know Lance because we share Second City France. You know, oh, yeah, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, so I think I st- I, st- I borrowed, I I, I, pro- I found a, uh, I found something in my backpack that was on, the, was on that set. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, over the years, I've taken things from, from sets, nothing terribly valuable. Oh yeah, uh, but but of course, the older you get, I don't know, you're you're too young, but you realize that these mementos aren't that important to you anymore. Oh, I, I mean, know, they're really not. They're you know, I mean, there are people. If you, when you're in the academy, the old days, you send you DVDs, so you voted on, you know, and and there's some people that keep, have whole ro- rooms and rooms of these DVDs that they get. I watch them throw them out or we used to give them to an old age home or we used to give them to the soldiers they don't let you do that anymore but i'm finding that that physical tangible mementos are not as important i mean when you look at it you go oh you know for three seconds you remember and then it's you know then it's not important Stuart, i do that now i do that now i'll go to the store and i'll be like oh i should buy this and then i go through this whole thing my wife watches me i do this whole thing like all right boy am i going to use this in a week or a month and then I just put it back because most of the time I'm like, "What do I need? Like, what do it, you it, really?" They're need? dust catchers. It's they're dust catchers. Exactly. Yeah. But I always think I always ask people because it's like, do you ever think like your first script? I'll oh, let me pocket that away or like these little things over the years. Well, I have kept scripts. I have oh, cool. kept scripts. They're in the closet over there. To be honest with you, I haven't looked at them in you know forty years. I, they, I will. If we ever have to move or, or, or we get tired of them, I will throw them away without much regret, you know, because, you, you know, what do you do? You look at them. I mean, I have phone numbers in my filing cabinet of casts that I work with. That's yeah. as much, you know, and that's as meaningful to me as looking at an old script. I that mean, is cool. Yeah, but I do keep scripts. I don't know why. I keep behind me, you can't see it, because I, I blurred you out. Yeah, yeah. Because I have all my, all my porno in the back here. Exactly. Uh, I'm I sure have, you block out the porno. Yeah. I have uh, 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 DVDs of stuff that I've done. I do that. I, I, cool. I try to make copies of some of the work, mostly for my son when uh, when I'm uh, molding in the grave. Do you like watching your work when it's yeah, all done? I do. I do. Lots of people don't. I do. You know, you get moments when you go, oh, I wish that I'd done something different. But for the most part, you see, I work hard on the script before I, I perform a stage or screen. I work hard on it and uh, I, I do for the most part what I want to do. So when I watch it, it's like, yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of what I wanted to do. Uh, so yeah, I kind of enjoy it. Um, is that ego maniacal? Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> or some people might avoid it because they don't want to watch it and be like, wait, they use that take. That's the take well, they used. Well, you know, in the beginning, I, <laughs> this is just a, First thing I did, I won't say what it is, although I've already said it, when I saw the screening of it. Yeah. I'm a stage guy, so I don't understand this editing stuff. When I saw what they did and how they edited things to this day, it just does still bother me. I drove down, you know, away from, from our from the screening. I was screaming. My wife said, Pull over, you're gonna have a heart attack. I mean, I was so angry because I wasn't used to that. You know, on the stage, 
you do a play and every night it changes or or you do you settle into something or you discover something you put it on film and, and it's in the hands of some editor and he does you know you cut to one scene you're going <laughs> they cut back and you're going you know i mean and it just drives you crazy i'm a little more used to it now i mean there 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 are things even recently that i'm not crazy about how they edited me or how they cut me or you know, but I, I don't get angry anymore. I can't. I can't afford to. I'm. I'm creeping towards death, Doug, and I don't. Wanna, <laughs> I don't want to speed it along. Oh man! So, so Stuart, it's been great. When you were coming up, was there anybody that ever gave you advice? Because I know, like we mentioned, like the people that live off of this, it's like they say in. I guess. I guess in some sports that people are like this, but you don't want to give the young guy any advice because he's out for your job. <laughs> Did somebody give me advice? Yeah, did you ever have anybody that took you under your wing or be like, hey, kid, this is how you uh, look at that camera? No? No, no. In 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 the East, in college, yeah, my, my directors <clears throat> and producers in college and in, in, in the summer theater did all the time. I mean, we collaborated. But in California, no, I had no real mentor, nobody. Maybe that's why. I mean, nobody, maybe everybody was so selfish. They didn't want anybody to get ahead. Exactly. I think that's true. Well, it, it could very well be true. I mean, uh, it, there, it makes sense. There's so much competition out here. You know, you walk into these rooms in the old days, you would audition for something, and I, I'm making it up. There's 20 people in the room. And then you get a call back, and I hope people know what that is. You come back, and <clears throat> maybe there's 10. Now you go for the audition, or when I used to do it, get 20 people you come back there's 50 people for the callback yeah they don't know what they they want you to solve their problem but they don't know what they want that's the yeah. problem so there's a lot of competition and I, and everybody's very friendly in those rooms you know everybody there's a lot of i call them audition friends <coughs> sorry i'll cut it all is, out don't worry. is this video or audio well no I, I i i clean it all up don't worry about it i got one more cough in me <coughs> it all out. i'm drinking some bubbly soda I know. I, yeah. Yeah. So uh, what was I talking about? Auditions or? Yeah, I know. I was just talking about if anybody ever took <clears throat> you under your wing, like with competition, but you were saying with auditions. No. Yeah. No. There, when I first got there, the kids in San Pedro Bums, there were some of the actors who had been there longer, talked to me about what to expect maybe and this and that and the other thing. But I kind of learned it on my own. That was the exciting part. <clears throat> I mean, there was nothing more exciting about walking on a set and seeing and seeing that movie stuff yeah. you know the cameras and the lights and the walls that opened up and it, it was it, it was magic it really was magic it's it's still magic i don't do it so much anymore but it's still magic when it happens i mean it's still very exciting and uh <coughs> i'm just glad i had the opportunity to you know to work out a little bit to to, to play yeah, that's what you, Jason says. He says you, you want to play on the set. You want to have a good time, and you love it. And then obviously, I can't sit here and tell you your most fun time on, you know, any any of the shows because you've been on so many. But it must have been a blast being on Curb. <laughs> that was good. That was a great an actor's dream. You have to learn lines. <laughs> yeah, know, talk about improvisation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's what it is. They're very protective. They won't even let you look at the storyline. I you know. know. You just show up on the set. You kind of know what the what the what the point is. <clears throat> they tell you the points to 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 get across action. You know, and you're talking blah 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 blah. Cut. Now you got to get in this. You got to say this. I see. Action. Blah 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 blah. Cut. Okay, that's great. Now you got to say her name. You know, I mean, that's the way it went. And then you sort of try to get a rhythm with Larry. And uh, it, it it's a great it's a it, it's a great job for an actor. I mean, I, I wish. If Jeff Garland uh, was uh, kidnapped by aliens, I'd be happy to step into that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, man, Stuart, this has been awesome. I'm so happy that I got the chance to talk to you because you've been in so much that I loved over the years. And oh, cool. uh, it was just cool to hear your story and like, I don't know, shoot well, the shit any, for an uh, hour. Seriously, anytime, anytime. But uh, don't remember to tell people about Deep in the Forest. I will. It comes out on VOD, Video on Demand, on May 31st. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it's a pretty good movie, and people should uh, enjoy seeing it. And, awesome. Uh, Do you like playing roles like this? Because this is kind of different for you, right? It is different. It, that's exactly right. It, it is different. I got. I don't usually get to play, uh, you know, a sick old guy 
although I am a single guy, no, I'm not saying. Uh, you know, it's it's different than some of the stuff I've done, certainly when I was younger. And even yeah. as I'm coming up on stage, yes, I've done that, but not on film. So it was a nice opportunity to work out. Uh, uh, Jeremy had left some of my stuff in, it would have been better, but that's, hey, that's his, that's his <clears throat> prerogative. I'll deal with him later. Yeah. <laughs> I know a very big, Italian friend that can take care of that, but Good. that's that's not, not that's fine. <laughs> that's not important. I'll cut that out so he doesn't find out. But thank I, you, thank you, Stuart. Good luck with everything. You're one of the you're one of the good ones, Doug. Thank you. Oh, uh, thanks, man.